gat dat de middenpartijen laten vallen wordt opgevuld door nieuwe bewegingen. Volt is een pan-Europese politieke partij opgericht om tegenwicht te bieden aan het groeiende populisme en nationalisme. Vanuit 40 Europese steden zijn al meer dan 20.000 mensen actief. Waaronder opvallend veel mensen uit het bedrijfsleven. Oprichter Andrea Venzon heeft zijn baan als consultant bij McKinsey opgezegd om met Volt de politieke strijd aan te gaan. The idea came to me right after the Brexit. Obviously there were some, you know, progressive parties, some national parties that were pro-European, but there was no significant force that could stand up against the wave of extremism and um, other negative sentiments that cross our continent starting from 2016. So I thought, why? How come there is no one ready to stand up, ready to pick up the fight and say, no, I won't give in. And I want to add just one thing. The European Parliament will not be the end game. Because remember, politics is mostly local. We have to solve problems where they started. So we are already getting ready for the next wave of elections. We are already getting ready to build a project to last for 5, 10, 20 years. Compleet tegen de euro. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second live sessions with the local, um, with our local candidates, actually our local frontrunners. Um, we're doing this session in English because we have a guest from Frankfurt tonight, Eileen O'Sullivan from Volt Frankfurt, and she's here to talk with um, Erik from Volt Enschede and Jacco from Volt Eindhoven about digitalization. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves briefly to our viewers. Um, and to our viewers, please let us know um, what kind of questions you want us or you want them to answer. So don't hesitate to send in your questions. Well, first, um, Erik, do you want to start? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm Eric. Um, I'm studying uh, my master's in cybersecurity at the University of Twente, and I'm the lead candidate for Volt in Enschede, which is uh, uh, a Dutch city of 160,000 inhabitants close to the border uh, of Germany. Um, and yeah, I, I'm looking forward to this uh, Q&A. Uh, I think digital affairs is uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting uh, themes for, for politics in general. It's also the main reason why I joined Volt. So, uh, and I'm very happy also that uh, that Eileen is here as our example best practice of uh, Dit That's how it's called, right, in Germany? Uh, digital affairs in Frankfurt. Thanks, then Jacco. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Jacco Rubekamp. I was born and raised here in Eindhoven, 24 years old, and I, started out my career as a journalist and I got very sick and tired of seeing journalists just kind of bumble around with populism and, and all kinds of rising negativity and, and just kind of standing at the sideline. And out of nowhere, I saw Vault and I thought, damn, this is actually constructive, not totally negative as constructive politics often still is. And I thought, yeah, this is the, the place I want to wanna be and, and, and where I want to do my thing as well. Um, and as for Eindhoven, Eindhoven, especially in digitalization, has a long way to go. Um, our city municipalities um, uh, affairs on digitalization or digital affairs in general are not great, uh, to say the least. Um, there's even been questions in national parliaments about it and uh, data leaks every now and then. So we've got a long way to go. And I'm very happy to have you here, Eileen, because I've got some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's what she's here for, too. Um, so, Eileen, um, I already mentioned that you're here all the way from F Frankfurt. Um, can you tell our viewers a little bit about who you are and what you do? Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm very looking, very much looking forward to hearing what the challenges are in Eindhoven because I cannot imagine they'd be bigger than the ones that we've been meeting here in Frankfurt. 
Um, so my name is Alina O'Sullivan. I'm part of the Volt Frankfurt team in Germany. Um, I joined Volt in 2018 um, and was politicized by the so-called refugee crisis, um, where I guess Europe didn't manage to get their act together and coordinate proper help for everyone who were seeking a new life um, and leaving their own old one behind, even though they probably did not want to. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what politicized me. And I looked at all sorts of different political parties and um, say, like similar to what Jaco just said, I found Volt and I thought these people have a positive message. There's a vision and not like um, a deconstructing of everything that's bad, but actually a place we want to go to, which is something I was really looking for. And um, the pan-European aspect just made a lot of sense to me. My father is Irish, my mom is Turkish. Um, it's very confusing, but it's very, uh, you know, unifying to just be able to call yourself a European citizen of many. Um, and so last year, about a year ago, um, on March 14, we had our elections, our municipal elections here in Hessen, which is a region where I'm in, in Frankfurt. And uh, in Frankfurt, we managed to get four seats and we sort of surprisingly ended up in this coalition here, um, which we are really happy about. And we took over the responsibility for digitalization, public offices, public services, um, participation and EU affairs. So we're doing lots of different things in the office, but digitalization is definitely one of the big things and most definitely the biggest challenge of all, all topics that we're taking care of here. That's really cool. So can you tell us a bit about what your what your job entails because um well um, a lot of our local teams use you as an example or wethouder uh, digitale zaak is what we call it here in the netherlands um so most of us would want someone who does your job here as well can you tell us a little bit more about what you do sure yeah um i just mute myself in between because i have our really old uh, dog sleeping here and she's 13 so she snores and i'm sorry if you guys can hear the snoring so um basically we actually weren't clear as to what the job was ourselves in frankfurt because we really had to get an understanding of how does this municipality work and um, how are different positions being given to different people you know um, what are the kind of negotiations that we have to have to, you know, be able to um, actually take care of the topics that we wanted to take care of and prioritize, I guess, also um, as part of this coalition. So um, we said we were going to obviously get a position as a wet hooder. No, howder. Okay, yes. it's one of those. <laughs> that was very good, vet howder. <laughs> vet howder. So we got a vet howder. And um, we, we decided to go for topics that we found were had been actually neglected in the last couple of years um, and maybe even decades, definitely for the case of digitalization. So I can really sympathize with, you know, your city not being up to date because that's something that we saw here in Frankfurt and it became really clear to us, one, throughout the COVID pandemic and two, also as we were running our own elections at how how much there is a lack of digitalization within the public offices and um, within politics and trying to get in contact with people. So we decided to go for digitalization and to bring it forward. And so that is what I'm trying to do right now. But what does that practically entail? So we have like offices that are part of our, as you said, Dezernat, um, as we call it here in Frankfurt, we're Dezernat number five. We have oh, number five, here we go. Um, and we have 12 of them in Frankfurt. And basically there is not one day that looks like the next. I know people say that, but it's actually true. So um, you wake up to a ton of emails and then throughout the day, you have lots of conversations with the offices that you're responsible for, as in like um, our IT office, we talk to them twice, um, twice a month for two hours. Then in between, we obviously still have like shorter conversations. Like you have routines, you know? Um, with all the offices that you have, but then you also have to think about what is it that we actually want to do and how can we do it. So that is basically what fills the gaps in between um, different things like plenary, for example, or committees. So um, you need to talk to lots of different offices within the municipality and sort of see what page are they on. If we want to digitalize something that is always something that is 
at least going to involve two offices, if not more, or like the entire public offices in Frankfurt. So there's an incredible amount of coordination, conversation that you need to have. You need to see if you can actually do things the way you want to by law, which um, in my opinion, and as I'm you know, getting, getting used to this job, even though I don't think there is any getting used to this madness, um, is that the, the law in Germany, it restricts us so much as to the things that we want to try, like uh, just piloting things and trying different projects is incredibly difficult because I guess it could be the same for the Netherlands. I don't know. It doesn't seem that slow uh, digitalization, but in Germany, definitely like our law is not ready for the di digital transformation that we should be going through that you can, for example, see in Barcelona that has happened. So um, yeah, there's not really one day that looks like the next. It's a lot of talking to people, signing things, reading stuff, getting up to date. There's constantly changes in IT. So, you know, there's always things that you need to look out for. And um, yeah, I feel like I gave a bit of a, an overall answer there, but I can become more concrete if you'd like to with regards to specific as aspects of the job. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for this for this overview. Um, I would love to know what Jaco and, and Eric think is like the most pressing issue right now in their respective city um, um, when it comes to digitalization. Um, but before we go to that, um, I'm sure you, yes, you, you participated in this partially. So we have our campaign video and for that we actually came to Frankfurt um, to film a little bit. Um, if you're okay with that, I think it's one of your colleagues or one of your local Volt members who um, helped out with that as well. Um, yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna, was there to hold the sign because I caught COVID, so yeah. Uh, to do that. Well, I'm gonna play the clip. Um, I'm gonna play the clip for you guys, and then we can discuss a little bit further. There you go. That was a very brief clip from our campaign video. And it was like five seconds, but we did travel all the way to Frankfurt for it. Um, <laughs> and so in that clip, it shows that um, the, the Wethouder Digitale Zaken helps to make sure that um, digital access, I guess, is, is well more accessible for, for everyone. Um, so you can eas more easily um, apply for, I don't know, subsidies, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you work that's, on that a lot? So that's like one of the jobs, I guess, that it entails. I think, um, so I'm not an IT specialist, but I have really good people around me that are. And so for me, I come from, um, political, from a political science background. Um, I guess the sort of the way that we look at it here in Frankfurt is to say, what is the ideal, like, a bit like Volt, you know, what is the ideal world we want to live in and how do we get there? And so I think nowadays access um, to, to the World Wide Web, access to knowledge, um, access to participating in everyday life, I think that is um, a question of equality also, you know, and so access to digital mobiles, digitalization as such, and digitalizing things in people's lives that help them acutely every day, people that really can't move around um, th that well anymore. You know, it's really a question of what society do we want to live in and are we digitalizing just for those who are like us, digital natives, or do we actually want to do it for those who have these physical, um, you know, incapabilities or issues and and have to get to the offices still and still want to participate in life and still want to see a concert but watch it from home so I, it's really the responsibility of politics to be able to to um to to block those gaps and you know to create bridges um because they're definitely not in place right now and i don't think they will form organically so i guess it's a question for us how do we make it accessible understandable for everyone and how do we make sure that people are also used to their municipality changing in this way, right? Because digitalization is 
we're going through such a huge transformational process in our society with digitalization that I think we really need to ask ourselves, has politics done enough to actually um, create an, a sphere where, where citizens feel like politicians know what they're doing with their data, are doing with um, the infrastructure of IT, like are really making them part of the process. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges um, in all honesty. I think that is the biggest one, the, the cultural transformation that we have to go through. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we, um, we actually received, we received a couple of questions. Um, so I'm going to pull the first one up in the screen. from Martijn um, about the war in Ukraine, actually. And I think it's a good good topic to mm. uh, to talk about as well, because that's a, a tragic situation and very, well, it's happening right now, so we can't not talk about that, of course. Yeah, it's, it's very relevant, of course. And I mean, now there are demonstrations uh, all through Europe. Yesterday, I was also at a demonstration here in Enschede. But I think, uh, especially from my field, cybersecurity, there was already a war uh, in Ukraine for the past uh, six to eight years. It was only a digital war, but it was definitely digital warfare. So I think it's a very valid question from uh, Martijn. Um, I, th I think Martijn asks specifically about uh, Zelensky's digital security. Um, so what I would imagine is that he will be advised and protected on what to do. But what I do know is that, uh, for example, uh, I think a warning went out to everyone in Ukraine to, by default, turn off their geolocation because um, people in Russia are uh, trying to use, sort of to find hotspots of where people are located and how people are moving. So I think it's at least important to be aware that if an enemy wants to follow you, it doesn't help if you have, by default, everything turned on. So your location turned on. That that doesn't that doesn't help. Um, I don't know if Martijn, that's what you meant. And if you're talking specifically about Zelensky, well, I mean he is the president. So uh, of course, uh, digital uh, technology is not only about the dangers, but it can also be very effective. And I think at this moment. Uh, he is showing that effective leadership is uh, is possible, and yeah, then you have to use all kinds of uh, ways to spread your message. So I think in in this regard, the fact that Zelensky is spreading a lot of information via all kinds of social media channels is actually a very good thing because uh, you have a lot of reach. So um, well, I think this is a question for both uh, Jaco as well as Eric. What kind of role do you see um, local councils or municipalities playing in the cyber security or digital security of its citizens? Um, if I may start, um, it, it starts with the simple things. Like in Eindhoven right now, there's um, a, a, a huge backlog of just old programs being used that are very vulnerable to certain attacks. So that's that's been put off just by, by budget cuts and budget cut but budget cuts because it's like it's the first thing that you won't notice immediately if you don't keep improving um so that's where you start start securing uh privacy uh, um uh, what's it called uh data pri private data of your citizens start there um and then start educating your civil servants because as of right now one in five civil servants in eindhoven uh clicks a phishing link so that's bad that's really bad and that that's that's th th that's the very start i'd say just education of your civil servants and keeping your stuff up to date and yeah that costs money but it's worth it in a long run yeah maybe to add i think um uh, for for the for the inhabitants of of a city, I think you can do a lot as a municipality on yeah, what we call in Dutch digitale weerbaarheid, so uh, probably digital resilience, uh, which means that uh, it it should be it should be known uh, by everyone in society and not just a certain part of society uh, what the dangers are. So, for example, 
especially small business owners should be aware that uh, they are not a, a target of ransomware because they're focused by a certain party. Uh, most ransomware groups are just uh, targeting everyone that's vulnerable. And that's something that especially small and medium business owners should know because otherwise you can always use the argument, yeah, but I have nothing important. Uh, for example, I'm a bakery. No one is going to attack me. And then for those kind of uh, businesses, it's very good to know it doesn't matter who you are. If you have a vulnerability in your system, you will get attacked because they are not, most attacks are not like very focused. They're just trying everyone. And if you're vulnerable, if you don't patch your software, let's say, then you will get attacked. So that's one thing. And you asked specifically about the municipality. I think in Enschede, uh, one very typical uh, event was that uh, the municipality of Enschede got fined for, I think, 700,000 euros uh, for illegal Wi-Fi tracking in the city center. And now uh, I think the municipality uh, are going to fight it in court. But this whole idea of fighting in court that your Wi-Fi tracking is not legal is for me showing that uh, there is no sort of basic vision of what digitalization uh, should be like. So for me, the first step is, I think, as a municipality, we should just, and and I think a, a wet houder or a determinantin uh, for digital affairs could help. Because first you need a vision of, okay, what role do we want digital affairs uh, to play in our, in our city? And for me, then... Uh, putting the whole city center full of cameras and tracking your citizens everywhere with tracking technology is not the place to start. I think, uh, yes, probably some marketeer sold it to the municipality as a great idea, but I think you should also always keep in mind the other effects. Uh, we already have a lot of citizens who feel, who feel a big distance to their government. And then it doesn't help if you always feel being watched and feel being tracked by your own government. So I think that's, yeah, that, that's sort of the, the story and the vision of, of digital affairs and how it can actually empower citizens instead of, uh, well, yeah, only for, let's say, security reasons uh, be implemented. I think that's a very important start. If I j can just jump in, I think that's really interesting to see that you guys seem to have similar, like, I guess, cultural issues where the people working in the public offices potentially are not IT savvy and don't understand digitalization necessarily the way we do, or I guess younger people do. Um, I don't know what the demographics are for you guys, but a lot of people working in public offices in, in Germany and especially in IT um, are a little bit older and specifically IT wise too, because, um, you know, you earn like three or four times as much in, in a, in a bank or in any other basically company, if you're not working for public offices and like this cultural transformation of also making people trust the process, understand the benefits of digitalization. Cause what, I mean, there's always this stigma and I, until now I thought it was very German, but it seems like there's obviously uh, something Dutch to it too, or maybe even European, um, to not, not quite understanding why one or governments would want one's data. So like explaining things like smart city projects, algorithms, internet of things is like, you really need to break it down and explain it to citizens to make them understand what the benefit is for them and also them to feel protected and in control of their of themselves and their privacy. And it's interesting to hear that that's apparently the same for you guys. Um, so we can share some best practices once you once you guys are in office, too. So I have a, I have a question for the both of you, Eric and Yoko. What are the first things that you guys want to achieve um, on the topic of digitalization when you uh, when you start in the in the council? That's a very tough one, but I, because there's a lot of things, um, I think that that's the case everywhere. Um, what I would really like to achieve is just making it easier for citizens to. Uh, to ask for um, 
I'm, I'm searching for the words here. Um, like volunteers, people who volunteer in the in the city have have a hard time getting permits and all that sort of stuff, and that all all has to be done either by paperwork or going to the city offices, and and that's one of those things. It could be a click of the button, just a, a very simple thing to make life a little bit easier. I'd like to see that. Thank you. All right. Yeah. yeah. Then I'll follow up. Uh, well, if you. If you talk chronologically about the first thing, uh, then it would be to have a, a wethouder of digitale zaken. Because of course, uh, it's not there yet. Currently, there is no wethouder. There, there is no yeah, portfolio, we say in Dutch. I'm not going to look for the English words. I don't know them. Um, so, and that's already part of the, let's say, the, the, the sort of uh, start before you have even a coalition. Uh, you can you can talk to each other and see if other parties agree that this is an important topic. And I think regardless of whether we are getting in the coalition, we do want to put it on the agenda uh, as high as we can. And I'm I'm very sad that there is no Ministry of Digital Affairs on the national level. I think that's it's a total uh, it's it's really it really frustrates me that apparently so many people in our parliament don't realize uh, how big the role is of digital affairs in our society. Uh, I mean, most people spend hours and, and sometimes four hours or more per day scrolling through like a, a, a commercial platform, uh, which is gathering all of your data and people have no ID. And I think if, if a government can't value how much influence that has on our society, that's ridiculous. But OK, that's on a national level. And then I think because we don't have that on a national level, we, we should still try to get this uh, into as, as high on the agenda as possible on a local level. So yeah, chronologically, that would be the first thing. Um, practically, I think it would be nice if I could uh, talk to the people working for the municipality and ask, OK, um, have you ever considered using uh, free and open source software instead of uh, the standard uh, software packages that you are usually uh, using. I think a very good example is uh, here at the University of Twente. There are all kinds of different faculties and most faculties are using the standard uh, software. So let's say all the, the Microsoft suits and the, uh, those kind of uh, things. And then there's one faculty, the ITC, the International Training Center, which has a lot of students from all over the world. And they are really coming here to get knowledge also from very poor countries to get knowledge and to implement it in their own countries. And there's one faculty which always uses open source software because they know we want those students to be able to use that same software that we teach them also when they come home in their own country. And now we are still, and I think it's also just being naive, we are still giving all our students, giving all our students the, the whole uh, Microsoft suit for free. Um, but then people don't know that there are, all, all, are also alternatives. And I think as the government, you should lead by example. So I think, and there's the famous slogan, if you use public money for software, then you should also use it to fund public code. So you might know about the public money, public code campaign. I think that is something very concrete that I, that I would like to see and, and talk about uh, from week number one. Thanks. Okay, so um, I have another question from from the comments, um, which is actually I think it's quite an interesting one. Um, should Volt keep spending money for commercials on social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter? And I would like to maybe add that and and sort of what do you think the role is there a role for local governments in? Um, well, regulating like those big companies such as Facebook. Who wants to take this question? Eileen, please feel free to, to join in on this discussion. Do you want me to start? <laughs> if, you, if you want to, I'm leaving it up for you guys. Um, I would have to think about the spending money for commercials on social media a bit, a bit longer, but on like from I do think that there's a necessity for us to be 
um, present and accessible and accept, access the people that are actually on social media. Um, I guess you could question, do we have to do that through commercials or do we just uh, work on viral campaigns? I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, I would actually hand this over to someone else. I want to hear what, what our candidates have to say on this, given that they're in the middle of an election campaign. Well, then um, who wants to go first, Erik or Jarro? Yeah, well, this is uh, Mark. Uh, Mark is actually a member from Volt, uh, Volt Twente. So I know Mark. And I think this is a very, uh, a very hard question for me because from my idealistic point of view, I think it's a very terrible idea that we're on the same hand in all our local election programs saying that we want to become less dependent on the big tech companies. And on the other hand, during our election campaign, we're uh, paying money for digital ads and basically sending money to all these uh, big tech companies. So I think that's, yeah, that's that's very strange. Um, ideally, we shouldn't uh, spend money on, on, on especially uh, digital ads. I think uh, targeted advertising, now I know we are not targeting, but advertising is, is I think, one of the things, uh, well, we can't do that on a local level, but on a national level, and, European level, we should ban as soon as possible. Um, so, yeah, that's the idealistic part. Now, on a pragmatic level, I see that within my own bubble, most people know Volt. But when I go out on the street, and uh, this week we were at some local markets in small villages around Enschede, there are still a lot of people who don't know Volt. And then uh, we have this story. So I can imagine that now that we're participating in elections for the first time, we're still quite a young party, we need to get reach. Um, I think for now, it's fine if we if we do it. But I would say that for every single uh, euro we spend on anything uh, big tech related, we also uh, donate to open source projects that we can build on that we can use that we can use for our party internally or in a municipality or anything that's relevant for a political uh, party. I think currently uh, we're not yet doing that, but I think uh, that that should be that should be the aim that at least for every money you send to these big tech companies, you also uh, you also help the let's say the alternatives grow and become more stable and more uh, usable. Thank you, Yoko. What do you think? Um... It's it's hard to add something to 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 a statement that so much nails it as as what Eric just said, um, because the truth is, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, even YouTube, those are very rancorous companies, or they are owned by very rancorous companies, or at least co companies that that encourage and and well not so much encourage, but they feed off of resentment toward each other because that just means more people online for longer typing more and more comments making more people angry making more people comment on that anger um so yeah that that is something we have to be very very aware of because if we're not aware of that um we could very much become hypocrites i think <laughs> because as eric said if, if you you want to get um, some independence off of these uh, these big tech companies, then you need to at least try and find some way out. And I think the um, spending one euro on, on, on ads on big tech and then spending one euro matching that amount uh, w would be a very good idea to match that amount to something that's more open source, more data friendly and less uh, targeted ads and stuff can i just add like maybe we're actually already cleaning up after ourselves because i mean we do want a european corporate tax we want better regulations we want more clarity as to what data is being used for for our citizens more education on digitalization maybe um as vault we're already sort of cleaning up the page from behind, you know, by um, paying for ads, running for elections, getting into office, and then getting the laws through that will actually, you know, protect citizens um, from this kind of exploitation that 
which is absolutely true you know facebook or, or meta as you call it um ha have been doing and are doing and it is true what jaco said they are feeding off of the comment sections where you know in the us democrats and republicans are throwing verbal stuff at each other and you know here people are fighting and so I think I think it even makes the case even more so for um, the importance of digitalization because you know it's interesting that in the Netherlands I really thought you guys were so much more progressive with regards to digitalization up to today um, because I've been really busy with looking at other German cities because you know the law is so different to really copy best practices for now it's easiest to look nationally but. Um, to not have a national ministry of digitalization, as you just said, I think that is one of those things um, that are keeping us from being on top and on top of these big tech companies. And I think as long as people are not in offices that know what they're voting on, which laws and regulations are absolutely necessary, I think Damian is currently like, or I know he's working on this, uh, on these data agreement acts on the EU level. There's so much that has to be done, but in the past, to me at least, I feel like a lot of people that made the law did not know what they were voting on. So it's really important now to bring digitalization, I think, and onto one of the front pages of how do we actually take care of our future and bring it under our control, empower our citizens, and also create more trust for the political sphere, because as long as there's no trust, why would you trust any even open software, even anonymized data that you're taking from your citizens if they don't actually trust you and whatever you're going to do with them and actually safeguard the data too, you know? If if I may ask a question, because in Eindhoven we already have a wet, wet uh, digitale zaak. Well, it's, it's in his uh, portfolio, I, I, I suppose I'll call it. Um, but it's kind of tucked away but beneath all the other things he has to do. It, it's kind of his fourth or fifth uh, portfolio. Could you imagine uh, having this in your portfolio as like a second to last kind of thing? It, what does that mean to the portfolio? Like digital, uh, that digitalization or, or digital yeah. affairs is just one of the topics that our vet houder, uh um, as to deal ah, with as, as so a topic next to other topics yes well that's the case for me actually because i like for example as you said the digitalization of the public offices that is fully my responsibility um there is a law in germany that says that all public services have to be able to be managed and accessible by the end of this year and all of the largest cities in Germany have put their hands up in the last years and have said, guys, we need your help in doing this. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. We don't know how to transform something that has never been digital into something like you actually have to translate every step of the way of a process within the administration to become digital. And really, German cities don't have the money for that and haven't really been supported in the way that they should have. So I am... It is kind of tough because I would love to spend all my time on digitalization too. But at the same time, if you have the right combination, and I think in our case in Frankfurt, um, that's the case. We look at digitalization, as I said, public services, also participation and EU affairs. So, for example, at the end of March, we're going to do um, an event for uh, on the conference on the future of Europe, um, which you know we at Volt love so much, but greedy citizens outside of our EU bubble really don't know. So we're going to bring like digital um, economy as a topic into the Frankfurt society and have a conversation with experts and with, with startups and see what do citizens need and want and how can we give that back to the EU level as learning from our side. So you can really combine all the topics and since digitalization is never like a silo topic. What are you going to digitalize if all you can take care of is digitalization itself? Like it's so much more than infrastructure. So I think there's actually a good case to be made for having multiple topics. However, I think the point you were making, I fully agree to because in the past, um, not going to look back, but I know that the people that have had this office in the past have prioritized different things like building new buildings and stuff like you really have to imagine that big topics combined to digitalization. And I think 
there's only 24 hours in the day. We don't want to burn ourselves out, even though we do, but we don't want to. So we try to go to sleep at some stage. It is quite hard to have lots of topics on your plate, but at the same time, it's, it's an opportunity to, you know, I guess you have to be smart about it, but I'll let you know how we get on with that here. Um, once, once we get on with all of that here. <laughs> maybe, maybe one more, uh, because earlier you were talking about like the, the sort of the, the big level of what you can do. I think in our electoral program, we also focus on, okay, we want the municipality to also be inclusive to people who don't want to use these uh, big tech platforms. So let's say that the municipality thinks, ah, we want uh, citizens to have a very convenient way of contacting us. And then probably their first plan is to, to use WhatsApp. And what we want to, to show is that, no, don't just go for the most convenient option, but always have an option open for to be inclusive, to not be dependent on these big tech platforms. And I think also uh, there we can, we can also talk with local sports and cultural associations and tell them that there are actu actually alternatives. I think it's even relevant for, uh, for, for war zones. I, I'm not sure if in Ukraine now the internet is shut down. But I remember earlier in, in, an, in a war in Ethiopia, the government shut down the internet. And then if you on, only use WhatsApp, for example, uh, it doesn't work anymore. But if you know that there are also apps that you can use that uh, communicate directly between two devices, you don't need internet at all, then you are directly empowering citizens. And I think that idea is, is where we can make a lot of difference. In the Netherlands, in almost every neighborhood, you have like this, uh, this small sign saying uh, we are caring here for each other in this neighborhood. And then it has a WhatsApp logo on it, WhatsApp Buurt Preventie. And then I think, no, that's that's not what I want to see in the public space. If I, I don't want to see the WhatsApp logo in every street, it's fine that we care for each other. Um, but I think as a municipality, also for those kind of small things, you you should sort of not normalize it that that these big tech platforms are taking over uh, our digital public space and somehow also slowly our physical public space. Well, um, I actually saw another good question um, from Thies, so I'm going to put it up in the screen. Um, do you guys know whether there's there's differences between municipalities, IT-wise? Um, and is it a goal for you to bridge them? I wouldn't know if there right now are, is a standardized uh, IT uh, solution for, for many uh, municipalities. But I do think it's it's a good idea to have, and I'm going to look at Eric, Eric because he knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, but if I'm reading this like this, I think that would be a great idea because that would pave the way for a quick and easy uh, communication between municipalities because problems even locally don't start or end at the the border of the municipality so even they're sharing information not per, uh, private data of course but sharing information is very important and having a standardized solution why not yeah i i, I mean this is this is a broad question but uh, are there standardized open source solutions yes there are a lot and they are also already being used so i know of a lot of municipalities or even whole states in germany who have already switched from using uh, the Microsoft uh, Office uh, suit to the LibreOffice suit. I know that the German government, I think it's a sort of, I'm not sure if it's a Ministry of Digital Affairs, but something similar is on uh, is active on the same social media plat platform that I'm active on, which only has, I think, 10 million users worldwide. But it's, uh, yeah, bunt, bunt.de, I'm looking at, uh, at uh, Eileen here, but I guess that's something from the German government. And I know that they're active on like the website social.bund.de, where they host their own sort of open social network. So that's, I think, also important. And um, I have sort of a, a, a very specific uh, social media bubble there, but I think it's a bubble of people who are aware how much they are influenced by traditional social media. 
So I think it's a very good sign if also municipalities on a national and on a local level are also active on those kind of social media. And every time you see like, ah, we as a municipality are participating on these platforms that you also see this logo of the thing that you don't know. But then when you look into it, that you realize, hey, this is, uh, for example, a social network without a business model, without ads, without an algorithm. So that's, I think that's a very sort of important first step about, well, what we call digital literacy, that people are aware that another world is actually possible and it already exists. I, I think that's really interesting with, um... When, when we look at Barcelona, for example, what I found quite fascinating there is that they have so much open data that they present to their citizens and they have lots of um, open source solutions. And what has happened because of that and because they've sort of, you know, informed their citizen as they were going through this digital and democratic transformation is um, that what has happened is that the citizens have become empowered to look at these open source solutions and at the data and think what can we make from this and you know create new applications that actually help the municipality and I think that is probably like the best case development that a city can do is to engage their citizens while they're being really transparent and open um, as to what they're doing with their data and how they're using it um, and so I think yeah there's lots of great examples where where we can go to but I think it is such um, a heavy lifting job to get even a, a smaller municipality from one software to the next because it's connected to so many different offices within the municipality and it feeds into different systems like changing out of a running system is really really difficult and so i can see why it's taking so long but there's really no more excuses so good thing you guys are running for elections i agree with that <laughs> um, Jan, can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the different points on digitalization that are in your election program? Um, well, one of the things we definitely want is the Wethouder for Digitale Zaken, uh, for Digital Affairs, um, but then as like the main portfolio, because right now it's not, and you can't just have it tucked away somewhere, certainly when you're in uh, when you've got such a back backlog as it is um so that's number one um apart from that we want um what's it called um amsterdam has this it's one of those be best practices um the algorithm uh, database like every algorithm the uh, municipality uses you can find in a database just some basic transparency um, furthermore, we really want uh, less cameras in the city because right now there's a lot of cameras uh, in the city that, well, at some point, at, at some places they really are necessary because there's constant um, well, uproar, let's say. Um, but in other places, it's just there for surveillance, surveil surveil excuse me, surveillance. And surveillance is, is good, but to a certain extent, you don't want to be a surveillance state. Um, so that's how we kind of want to find the balance because uh, a few cameras less could mean one more police officer in the flesh that could also talk to people, just not reactively uh, send out someone to, to a conflict, but actually t stop the conflict and resolve it before it even happens. Um, so a more human approach to digitalization as well. Thanks. Eric, what about you? Um, yeah, well, maybe to, to add to this, what, what Joko was saying, I think, I think uh, so the, the overarching topic here is then safety. Um, and, and I think uh, I agree with Joko that we should focus less on, on cameras. And that's what I was saying earlier, like this sort of feeling that ah, technology is the fix to all our problems. There's an app for that. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> I, uh, once uh, during university, I did a study like what is the most important factor for uh, safety in a neighborhood? And it was social cohesion. So I think even instead of hanging cameras everywhere, if you would spend more money on uh, streets, uh, let's say street barbecues once a year, uh, it would even be more effective for safety. So I think that's 
that you that's some uh, that's something you would never hear from a salesperson from a big uh, company that sells you uh, cameras because you can't really create a company well you can create a company to organize street barbecues but that's usually done by people themselves so you will never get a salesperson convincing people working for a government saying okay this is how you should approach safety in your neighborhoods but i think that's our task as as well at least digitally aware uh, citizens that we we know that okay you don't always have to look for technology to fix local problems so one of the things that we also have in our uh, in our election program is actually an idea from also a best practice from Rotterd rotterdam uh, there they have so-called stats mariniers um, and then we sort of uh, created the twins version twent uh, version of it so stats numbers uh, which are basically um people who are not from the police but their entire uh their entire appointment is to talk with everyone in a region and just see what's going on bring people together also bring people together from different levels so that people know where they get where they can go to and i think that's if you take it entirely away from let's say uh, the police and, and looking at if something is criminal or not but just as checking in and make sure that you are in contact with everyone, I think that's something that can can make a huge difference. And then indeed, it's uh, additionally you employ people instead of uh, instead of cameras to to make the city better, which is I think also just a great idea. Um, yeah, we have more ideas in our in our. Uh, but what do you want to hear more? Let's say. Um, I think also we have in our program uh, that we want to uh, invite uh, friendly hackers to uh, hack Enschede once in a while. I know in The Hague, this is already a big event, Hack The Hague, but I would really want to see that also in Enschede. Um, there's, a, there's a very good book that's called Helpful Hackers by Chris van Hof. And I think that was for me the first time I read, uh, like I think the book is a collection of 20 or more stories of how helpful hackers are actually contributing to to making uh, the government uh, safer uh, and also companies safer and i think that's also a way if you start organizing those kind of events then you will also attract the interest of young people and because we want this oh i just looked it up by the way wethouder is uh, something like alderman in english so if we would have an alderman and if one of his goals would be to attract more IT talent, uh, more IT uh, graduates to the municipality, then these kind of events help because then you show that you that you are actually uh, interested in their skills, that you value their skills. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, it has uh, it has two uh, advantages. So just for my image, you would then as an event, like invite people to actually hack the IT systems of the city so they can, yep. you know, you guys can spot like where your weak spots are and maybe also like a attract those same people that just hacked you to help fix it. Yeah, definitely. And this is already a common practice. Uh, I mean, it's actually uh, the Netherlands started with it with the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure. We were actually the first country in the world with such an institute. Um, but now it's already uh, good practice everywhere in IT land that that there are sort of bounty programs and that you can you can hack something as an ethical ha hacker and there is a sort of responsible disclosure program that if you uh, disclose your hack responsibly uh, that that you give let's say the organization ninety days time to fix it then they will give you a T-shirt that's what the Dutch government does or something something nice um, so that's already quite common practice um, um, and indeed uh, those those people are then sort of interested not only in money because I think as a municipality you will, we will never be able to compete uh, money wise to IT talent because they can earn much more at, at big uh, tech companies but especially uh, let's say the the young people who are also focused on making a positive impact on the world uh, if you can show that uh, they are not going to be the only IT person in, in the whole municipality uh, because that's I think a, a sort of a scary scenario if you have like 1500 people working for a municipality and then you only have like some people in the IT department you feel like ah no one is listening to us 
So I think you first need to create this, this feeling in the, in the municipality that IT is very important. And then if you combine that with a vision and with organizing such events, I think you can definitely uh, attract people to go work, uh, well, for, and that we call it algemeen belang. So for, yeah, for the, how do you say public, it in English? Public interest, I think. Yeah, for the, to work for the public interest. I think there will be, we can, uh, we can interest a lot of people for that, but first you need to do these kind of things and, and actually create a vision of where you want to be heading. Also free t-shirts. I mean, who doesn't want those, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, in the Netherlands, it's really a state status symbol. So uh, there's this right. famous black, this black T-shirt, which says, uh, "I hacked my own government, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt." If you see someone with that T-shirt in, let's say, the the hacker community, then it's like, ah, oh, it's a it's a sign of you. You usually show a sign of respect. They're That's actually it. they have like this special status. They're pretty much hate heroes within the community in the hacker community. That's pretty cool. So Eileen. Do you, what do you think about events such as these? Do you guys have that as well? Or do you organize stuff like that? Do you mean um, events where we talk about what we want to do after the elections, in the elections? No, I mean like the those hacker thingies. Ah, wow, I was taking that very literal. Um, no, I was just <laughs> thinking we actually, we actually um, have this idea thon coming up, which is something that came up in my mind, which um, we are not as a city um, haven't organized, but um, basically like this social innovation lab that helps especially women um, to get into their, like get their own business started. They've organized this event that we're supporting um, currently because there's so few women in IT as everyone knows. Um, and this specifically is really a really cool project that I love. And I'd like to tell you about it if I can take a second here. Um, so basically the idea is to get more women interested um, into the topics of artificial intelligence and help them get a business started. And um, what they do is you can basically apply until like mid-March now and individuals can say um, that they have some sort of idea for a specific thing for the public good. So you can think of a project that can be put into practice with the help of artificial intelligence that will create more public good. And you actually get experts and um, you have workshops and you have mentors that help you understand what is artificial intelligence? How does it work? How do we use it? How can we implement it? How can we benefit from it? Um, and to basically have a really low threshold as to like, what do I need to participate? You need two and a half days. You need to have an idea. You need to be able to sit down in front of a laptop and there you go. People are gonna help you understand what you can do. And then you can actually put your ideas into practice and I guess lose the fear of this abstract thing called artificial intelligence um, and that's not the same as what you guys are talking about with regards to IT security. That's obviously a very different thing, but I think it goes very much to opening the doors with regards to like the municipality towards citizens and allowing them to co-create projects and solutions for their cities, which is really important. And um, I personally also believe we need more women in, in, in every field of data research in every field of IT um, you know, maths and, you know, all of this, the, the sciences, but specifically in, for things like artificial intelligence, I mean, we've seen how um, artificial intelligence can discriminate because it doesn't use the right data set. And so looking at how few women are in IT, it sort of explains why the female perspective is lost often. So I think that is something that um, we're really going to look into here. So it's always great to, you know, encourage more women to not be scared of things like smart city and artificial intelligence projects and get them to you know participate and bring their ideas and in their perspectives just as a small small side note there are definitely women in artificial intelligence uh my girlfriend is graduating in explainable artificial intelligence so uh there are definitely people working on it and and there are more uh, send her to here. frankfurt yeah, and I think also this is maybe again a similar topic. So you're talking about artificial intelligence, but then also uh, if you don't have a lot of experience in artificial intelligence, you can have the feeling, ah, this is something we should use. Whereas if you have, 
if you are creating a vision on AI as a local municipality, you might arrive at the point, okay, we're only going to use AI if, it exp if it's explainable. And before that's, let's say, possible and usable, we're not going to use AI. Because as you said, uh, AI is well known for its very good uh, sort of uh, use of pattern recognition. But therein, uh, the data it's being trained on is very influencing, very much influencing uh, what comes out of it. So all, all, all sort of uh, inequalities that are existing in society will also uh, be even uh, be, let's say, how do you say it? Uitvergroot in English. They are enlarged uh, by usually by AI. And that's not even just the case for AI. Uh, I mean, there is a researcher here in, in Twente also who's writing about the digital gap. And even the fact that we, uh, as digital natives, uh, can use all the aspects of digital society to our advantage, and a lot of people can't, is also uh, enlarging existing social inequalities. So I think we should be very, very aware of that. Jaco, how do you feel about the topic of, of women in, in, well, digital affairs, I guess, and do you see a role for the city in that? Um, I think there's a role for every um, institution or organization in that. Because as of right now, um, I think, it, like, let, let's look at the members of Volt in Eindhoven. Eindhoven is uh, a city with uh, a technical university, so lots of students with a very technical background. And we see about 90% of the people who are in, in Volt Eindhoven are male. And that's basically because we have a, a university here that is very dominated by males. So I think there is, uh, on, on every level, there is a huge... Um, a huge improvement to be made and also everyone has their bit that has to be done i think even talking about it is is a step towards uh towards you know having people feel that everyone is welcome in whatever field and and sure there might be um traditional views that are uh ex exclusive in 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 basic in the very basics of it but I think as, as long as we keep talking about it, keep uh, making sure that people will want to apply because that's a thing as well. If I look at where I work uh, on a daily basis, um, the IT department is contrived of four old dudes um, who are socially, even for IT guys, very, very awkward. <laughs> and I love them, don't get me wrong, but that's a, a culture that you don't get into very easily. They, they, they have a very, well, let's say a male culture, uh, like as in the, the alpha male culture. But then, you know, how, how do you change that? I think that is the biggest, um, the biggest challenge, changing the culture uh, so that everyone feels welcome. And I think IT is one of the big, um, big steps that, or, or big, uh, obstacles in, 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 in that area. Well, at least we have Eileen, who is a very good example of a, of a woman in a good position in a very male dominated world, I'd say. Eileen, how do you experience that? Like, do you experience any sort of issues with that? Or is, is it actually like a very male dominated culture in your view or in your experience? Um, so in my case, I guess, like the woman, the person that runs our IT office in Frankfurt is a woman, which I found um, a, a really nice surprise when, when I when I hopped into the job. So that's great. And she's come from um, like a public company. So she has a non public office perspective on things, which which can help. Um, I do have to say it is quite challenging because it's quite annoying. So being a like the, the literal official translation from the city of Frankfurt is a deputy mayor. So I'm like 11 of these and then we have our mayor. And so I'm one of, I think, eight other women. And then we have three men um, or four men. Um, and I think for me personally, 
there's definitely been situations where, uh, for example, waiters would say to, to heads of different companies or, um, or organizations that, you know, when we go out for a business lunch and I'd look very businessy and we were talking business things, a waiter would ask like, oh, is this your assistant? You've never brought her here. And I would just sit there and think, wow, you know, like, of course, because she's the 25 year old female, she cannot hold a serious position or be in a position of leadership. Um, not even to mention her being in anything regarding IT, you know, like it, there's definitely heaps of stigma. Um, and talking to our twinning city in Lyon, they have quite young deputy mayors. There are two female ones and they experience similar things. So I guess being a woman in politics, you're always going to have to shout twice as loud um, to make your point right now. But, you know, we're breaking the ice. We're, we're moving forward. Um, but I think, yeah, I guess. I guess it's diff it, it's definitely a different experience. I think the age thing is a thing, too. Um, but I have to say, you know, if you just be well prepared, be better prepared than the others, know what to say when they say X, you know, like that sort of thing. If you just keep your, I, I don't want to use a swear word here, but keep your stuff together and really, you know, be aware of what you're doing and do your job well and finish reading the papers. Like you're going to be fine because if you know, I'm going to swear it out. If you know your shit, you know your shit and other people will know and they will know not to play you. But it's it can get quite exhausting sometimes to see how in comparison to men, you're not being taken as serious. Sure. Yeah. OK, I want to add slightly something to this uh, to this uh, conversation, because I think uh, we should also acknowledge that there are already a lot of women working in this domain. And actually, for me, my, my favorite book, I, I put it already on the table because I thought this would come up. Uh, Privacy is Power by Carissa Feliz. It's written by a woman. It's it's my number one favorite book. Uh, and Professor Eme van Weinsbergen, she's uh, a researcher on ethical artificial intelligence in Germany. I think she's one of the world leading figures on ethical AI. Um, Siri Behrens Behren from the Netherlands, uh, she's also writing a lot about this topic I was talking about earlier, like techno optimism, that technology is always a solution. Um, and also here in Twente, uh, two or no, I think already four years ago, we had an event, uh, Alice and Eve, I think it's still, yeah, Alice and Eve.nl, uh, where they showcased uh, an entire uh, overview of all women in computer science uh, that that's uh, from, from history. And there are so many examples of inspiring women in this domain. So. I think also at some point we shouldn't be saying, yeah, this is something that still has to come, but we should also recognize and highlight the women who are already working in this domain. Because for me personally, uh, well, I already showed you the book, but my main source of inspiration are more women than men. Because the men, men in the IT world are usually the CEOs of the big 10 companies. So uh, there you sort of see the difference of where I get my, uh, my ideas from. Nice, thanks. Yako, do you have do you want to add anything on this specific topic? Well, I'm not sure because this is of course as as a male I've I've got a lot less to say about a topic like this than than perhaps you two Eileen and Milen uh, uh, do. Um but knowing that from my background I was uh, uh raised by by two mothers. I I've noticed a lot about, uh, like my mother, she, she works at a semi-government agency and she found out that she's been working there for about 40 years. And after 30 or 35 years working there, she found out that she had been paid less all those years than her male co-workers and, and for the exact same work. And, and that's something... It, it, we always talk about well, well a, a topic that always comes up in 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 this is is the pay the gender pay gap and certainly for males it's it's something you don't really notice because that is that that is a truth you know it, you don't talk about salaries you don't that's sort of a, a an etiquette and i'd say 
break that etiquette, talk about how much you earn with your coworkers, um, because that's the only way you can get some power over whoever is paying you. Um, and that's one way you can kind of break that part of uh, the, the gender gap in, 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 in the broader sense of the, the term. Yeah, that's, a, that's really good. That's really good of you to say, um, because as we know, in, in our local city councils, um, the gender gap is pretty big, or at least most of, like, I think 80% is female, something like that. Uh, sorry, male, I mean. 29% so is, is female. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so 70% male. Um, so there's a big in order to sort of balance that out. Um, so I see that we've been talking for over an hour now. Um, <laughs> it might be time to sort of uh, wrap this up a little bit. I would, however, like to give all of you um, still a bit, still some time to, um, well, say something that you want to tell our viewers. Um, Eric, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I think these are super interesting conversations. And uh, for anyone who's watching, uh, I'm always open for conversations about this topic, uh, especially if we're elected uh, here in Enschede for the upcoming four years. Uh, also, Eileen, I'm coming to Frankfurt to talk with you about this because uh, I, I, I think it's really cool that we as Volt already have you uh, in the Municipal Council as a Ditsanentin or Alderman. Uh, with digital affairs in your portfolio. I think it's uh, really good that we put it on the agenda. So, uh, yeah, uh, I look forward to... Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Milena, for uh, uh, making this happen. Thank you as well. Um, then, Jaco. Yeah, I, I want to thank you too, uh, Milena, and also you, Eileen, for, for showing up and then being here. Um, it's, it's been very interesting for me because this is a topic I know less about. This is not my area of expertise. Um, so it's been very interesting to hear uh, your guys' perspectives on this. And and I too want to, to ask anyone, uh, if you've got any questions for me or Eindhoven, uh, be sure to, to let me know. I'm, I'm always open for a conversation because I think, I think that's the, the true way forward. Um, so yeah. Be sure to find me and I want to thank everyone for, for watching. Yeah. Thank you very much. Then Eileen, famous last words. <laughs> no pressure. Thanks you three for, for having me. It was really so nice to, you know, just have a chat about this. And I was actually going to invite you guys, but happy to see that you're inviting yourselves. It's just the way I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I wish you guys lots of lots of power because election campaigns can be so exhausting if i recall correctly correctly your election day is on my birthday so you're welcome best of luck <laughs> um, and and fingers crossed and uh, yeah anyone watching you guys should definitely vote for vault because we need to get young people into these positions because we know what we're doing we use these devices all day and we swipe on them like no one else does so Good luck and and um, best of best of power all the way to the day of the elections. You're amazing. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Eileen. We very much appreciate it. Um, it'll be a great birthday gift for you if we uh, if we get elected. Um, well, and with that, um, I would like to well thank you, Eileen from Volt Frankfurt, Jaco from Volt Eindhoven, and Erik from Volt Enschede. Um, for being here tonight and answering these questions and talking about this topic. Um, for everybody watching, thank you very much. Um, we're going to have some more local um, live trackers. I don't know the English word for that, front, front runners? Um, lead candidates. Yeah. Lead candidates, thank you. That's a very nice word. We're going to have some more uh, local lead candidates answering your questions over the next couple of days. Um, and. Yeah, 14, 15, and 16th of March. Don't forget to vote. Thank you very much, guys, and have a great evening. See ya. You too. Bye. Bye.
Thank you. Bye.